you so much, Melissa. Many of you know my mind works very crazy. When you were talking about the alphabet soup, all I was going to say is, as long as you just say R E S P C T, you know that's the only one that I need. But uh, an homage to Aretha. But um, you know, thank you so much. And you know, to to talk about the sort of the softball. Uh, many of you guys know how much I love baseball and softball. I attribute a lot of that to Paul. And my wife may not feel that way, but uh, but uh, Paul, you know, Paul and I share share that bond together. And when we won the championship, you know, it really was just a, a euphoric feeling of, and it wasn't just an individual thing. It was the team, you know. And I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but I'll, you know, to really what I was going to talk about to close this, we're just grateful. I am grateful every single day that I get to work with fantastic people like yourselves, uh, the great team that I have, and you know, and that I get to work with, and just they make me better, and you guys make us better. So just thank you so much for for everything, um, the relationship. You know, we we talk a little bit. I'm a, a classic movie fan, you know. So many of you heard me say this. You know, we just are so honored to be a part of your team. And, um, you know, I always think of Humphrey Bogart at the end of Casablanca, you know, Louis, this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. And that's what I feel. I love many of you very dearly, and I'm just honored to work with you. Um, what we're going to talk about right now is, um, you know, really sort of the investment side. And in the past, we used to bring out, you know, charter financial analysts and guys that are really in the weeds. As Melissa had really talked about, um, you know, part of the thing that, you know, we've seen is that, hey, you, you, Follow your unique ability. What are you really sort of good at? And what we found is the best analysts, the guys that are able to really sort of dig it underneath things, sometimes they're not necessarily the best public speakers. So when we brought them out before, they, they brought up a lot of very good stuff. But what we heard as the feedback is like, I didn't really understand what was good. What the key message that we really want to make sure that you know, because many of you have brought up. Uh, us into your lives because, hey, you don't want to be following all this stuff. And, you know, as Melissa talked about, we are, you know, committed as between meetings, we're doing research, we're doing due diligence, we are a learning organization, the team is always constantly, you know, attending seminars, listening to podcasts, reading books, all those different things on investment ideas. And what I would share with you is nobody really knows the future, but it doesn't mean that you're not constantly looking ahead. So some of the things that we wanted to sort of share with you, this is one of the partners that we work with. Um, he had shared that got this uh, presentation through Lincoln. And I, as I looked and prepared for this, I really felt like this really told a very good story in something that all of us could understand. And so you can see many of you have known the hallmark of Hartford Financial Group. Matt and Paul used American Funds and, and Franklin Templeton for a lot of years. We still partner with them. And um, they, in addition to some of the other asset managers, helped to put this presentation together. So right now, if you've read some of our blogs and, and so on, you know, we're in the midst of a bear market. It's really painful. And, you know, what's the cause of it? You know, if you really narrow it down, it's these first two bullets that you see on the side. It's, it's all about inflation. And then subsequently, the Federal Reserve's response to it. This time last year, people were thinking, hey, you know, inflation's up in that 8 or 9%. It's going to come down and so on. But, you know, inflation has, has hung on. And that's really the, the, the thing that you can see on here. Last, uh, in in 2021, you know, at, in February, we're coming out of the pandemic. It, the inflation rate was 1.6. And over the last, you know, almost two years, it really sort of skyrocketed to a peak of 9.1. Now, you know, as we do our due diligence and as we sit in the meetings, there's, it's, it's a mixed bag, right? There's some good things that are out there. There's some not so good things that are out there. It's starting to come down. But we can't declare that, you know, mission accomplished. So, you know... If you go into the next slide, Diane, one of the things that you can see, what's the Federal Reserve doing with this? So you're probably hearing a lot of this. The way to combat inflation is the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. They've raised interest rates so far this year. And it's not that the raising of the interest rates is a negative thing. It's the rate that they've had to do it that's really called, wreaked havoc on the stock market, the bond market. Because this has been a year not typically when the stock market goes down, the bond market goes up. But because interest rates have gone up so quickly, it's negatively affected bonds as well. And so as we look out, and you can see that what's in solid red is what's happened so far, the question of how much more they're going to keep raising interest rates, that's 
no one knows. And, you know, the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, uh, pretty much said, you know, that's his number one objective is to fight inflation. Um, if you read our blog recently, uh, and, and uh, apologies for those who have read it, but, you know, for those who may have not read it, we follow a guy named Nick Murray. And one of the things that he talks about, he gives a great analogy of how you want to think of this dynamic between inflation and rising interest rates, which may cause a recession. And, you know, Nick uses the, the, the metaphor of cancer. You know, cancer unchecked by itself is, is obviously a very extremely negative thing. A, a, a less bad option is chemo. Nobody really wants chemo, but you know, oftentimes if you have to contrast between letting letting cancer just go or getting chemo, we'll we'll take the chemo, and that's where the Fed is right now. They don't. They have to have fight inflation because all of us are consumers, and we need price st uh, stability. You can't go to the store from week to week and have prices changes. It, it wreaks havoc on your budget. So that's why inflation, fighting inflation is, is so, uh, so crucial. So you know, one of the things that happens, though, is that by raising interest rates, it makes it harder on the business community, and it potentially might cause a recession. And so they talk about it's like if I have to if I have to choose the lesser of two evils, I will cause a recession versus you know letting inflation go unchecked. And many of you you know lived in the late 70s, early early 80s when inflation was in the mid to high teens. And we don't want to go back to those 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 types of environments. Um, you can see on here you know one of the things that that and, and the question is. You know, hey, are we in, are we in a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And all those those different things, and you know, you can see some of the projections is you know, it's a 50-50 you know flip a coin of whether we are or not. Regardless, we're in, you know, it's a painful period of time, as you guys know in your investments. The thing that I would probably say for you is don't get caught up in are we going to have a recession? Or are we not? Because oftentimes, and it, we'll show you a little bit later that you, you don't know, you know, the, the markets, and particularly the stock market, is a leading indicator. So it means it's ahead of where the economic types of things are, and usually you don't know you are in a recession until after it's over and they have the data, data to support it. So I, the thing that we really want to uh, talk about is, as, my, as Michael had talked about in retirement income planning, that's why it's so crucial for us, the bucket plan, thinking of your money in now, soon, and later, is, is that, you know, we really want to set that up so that you, you, can get, you can ride out the volatility to let the stocks come back. And you know, your stocks are mostly in the later bucket in money that you're not going to need for 10 years. So it's down, and hopefully you have other resources that you can draw on to let it recover. In the backdrop of, of this, you know, in addition to, to you know, the, the inflation and uh, you know, rising interest rate situation, we are in the midst of a, an election, if you hadn't heard, you know, and, and so on. So we're in the midterm elections. And, you know, it's gotten less of the fanfare, but traditionally, um, you know, what, what markets hate is uncertainty. And so, you know, when it comes to, you know, with elections, we don't know, hey, who's going to be in charge? What policies are they going to do? So typically in years that, that we have elections, the markets can be very choppy. And, but, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is that once that election occurs, um, and you probably can't see that, particularly at the end of the back of the room, but at the bottom of that, it basically says the average uh, one-year return after that election typically is a positive 15%. Once, once the door, sort of dust is settled, we know what, what is likely to be the policy actions and, and so on. The market, you know, market can absorb that and, and typically respond positively. Um, you know, I can't remember the movie, but it's like you don't know nothing about nothing, you know, or something along those lines. This field has been it, tremendously humbling for me, you know. And I always tell people this, you know, for people that say, you know, uh, they, hey, this is going to happen in the future, you know, they're either deluding you or they're deluding themselves. Nobody really knows because our market environment is, is very complex. It's sort of like a hurricane, right? You know, it's heading one direction, then it's nature, and it goes off into different things. There's so many factors that go into the market. So it doesn't mean that we don't look at it. It just means that you have to have the humility to know it, it's not always going to, it's not going to follow, uh, you know, a, a given path. So, but with that being said, you know, you can see on here, what all this is, is we, we are constantly finding, you know, doing research, reading, what do you think is most likely? And so, you know, part of the thing that you look at and what you should glean from this slide is that, you know, 
you know, the, how long this inflation issue is going to last. It could be six months, it could be a year, it could be two years, you know, as, as they keep fighting it. And, and it's, they're, they're just going to see how, to, how it responds. So that's, that means that we're more likely to get rising interest rates. There's a likeliness that we can have a formal recession, all those different things. Um, one of the things that I want you to do, we just went through our training and our, we had some great, great instructors. Okay, repeat after me. Green, good. Red, bad. Green? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, hey, we all know that, right? Uh, it's just some sort of tongue-in-cheek, you know, kind of thing. But um, what, what the purpose of this slide is really sort of show you the two most uh, scarring bear markets that we've had, in particular in the last 20 years, was 20, 2000 to 2022. We had the, the bursting of the dot-com bubble plus 9-11. And so, you know, we had a recession there. We also had probably the worst recession of our lifetimes, you would have to go back to the Great Depression, was the crisis in 2007, 8, 9. And that was a much bigger thing than what we're going through now because that was our whole financial system. You know, bad loans, banks took on a lot of those, those different things. And our whole financial system could have came, you know, came collapsing down. So as you look on here, as in contrasting 2000, in 2007, 8, 9 to where we are right now, there are things that are blinking red, but there are things that are positive that, that are out there, particularly unemployment. If, if a person wants a job, they can get a job. We're, we're trying to find Diane's role as our, as our uh, chief operations officer. We, it's hard to find people that, that out there. And typically in a recession, it's not only do you have a lot of challenges, but it's hard for people to find jobs and unemployment rate goes up. So you can see on here companies, you know, we, you know, you know, going through this rising inflation, it's affected our spending decisions, but it still means, hey, we're still going out there and buying things that we need, which correlates into the companies you invest in really are still very profitable. This slide, when I saw this, I really, really liked it. So if you look over to the right-hand side and they look at the bottom, what, it, what it's really sort of conveying on here is the different inflation levels from zero all the way up to 6%. And what you should see on there is when inflation is above 6%, the markets tend to have negative rate, rates of return. And as you can see, as it comes down, and what Jay Powell, as the chair, chairman of the Federal Reserve, is trying to do, he is trying to get it down to more normalized levels in that three to four percent range, which then you can see sort of the positive economic, um, you know, and positive market returns that happen on there. So that that's not why he's ra he's lower or raising rates to fight inflation to do the markets, but he's he's well aware that it has that side effect, you know, that that goes on there. We need price stability. All right, this is a busy slide, but but um, I'll, I'll sort of interpret for you. This shows you the bear markets over the last um, 70 years. And drawdown as a term is from the peak to the bottom, how far did it drop? On average, the average bear market exists, or it uh, drops 32%. So we're in that range, we're very close to there. The average period that, that, that exists is usually 11 months. Now, you know, so it, it can be about a year, we're right in that threshold, but you can see 73 and 80, they did have periods of drawdown where it, it lasted almost two years. So, you know, if you read the blog, one of the things I talked about, I joke about being Dr. Doom, you know, it, I'd love to say, hey, it's all going to be, you know, roses and butterflies. But, you know, it could be more painful before it gets better, you know. And largely we're recommending that you stay the course if you can. Um, if, you, if you can't, then it's always your money and we can talk about that. But we would recommend largely that you stay with it. The reason behind it is if you look at the subsequent returns one year later after the, the, the bottom of the bear market, one year later, it's positive 17%. Three years later, it's positive 36%. Five years later, it, it's 61%. So you want to think of it like a, a rubber band. You know, when you snap that rubber band, it just it goes back. And so, hey, it goes down, but it, over time, because what do you, you got to remember, what are you invested in? You're not invested, well, technically you're invested in stocks, but what are stocks? They are in, in bonds. You are investing in the best run companies, not only in the country, in the world. And they've got a lot of smart people to keep, you know, keep cash flows going, staying profitable, all those different things. Um, Warren Buffett says in the short term, the market is a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine, meaning it goes back to its value. And 
Ultimately, what drives the markets are earnings. You can see, we've seen it over the last 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, the tracking of the markets tend to go with the tracking of the earnings. This is a busy slide. This is called the Callan chart, and it's, it's called the Callan periodic table in, in homage to our old chemistry classes and, and, and things along those lines. Now, once again, that's probably hard for you to read sitting at your, your, your seat, but the thing about this is that if you'll notice, uh, well, and, and how you read it, if you look on there, at the top, this is every given year, um, what is the top performing asset class to the worst performing asset class? And so one of the things that you can see on here is just like sports teams, there's no team that wins the championship indefinitely. There, you know, it's not the old days when the Yankees used to win every single year. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things where it, it's constantly changing. And so you know, one of the things that I've been communicating to clients right now, cash makes us feel good right now. You know, and, it, and people are, hey, should I move my money to cash? Well, if you, if you parse this, this presentation a little bit further, you'll notice that in the subsequent years, after, when cash is the best performing asset class, which it is this year, or one of the top ones, um, it's usually the worst performing asset class the following years. So, you know, this, it's just taking that long-term approach, thinking bucket plans. Now, soon and later, thinking retirement income, if I've got the guaranteed income, you know, really sort of cover it. Um, you've seen this on some of the um, presentations we've had in the office. And how I sort of think of the markets, it's like a river. The, you know, this goes back to 1971, so over the last 50 years. You know, ultimately, we have crises. You know, we've had wars. We've had economic challenges and all those types of things. But, you know, you, you stick with the long-term investment program, it, the market is, tends to go up. Now, of course, can we make the guarantee of that? No, but that, you know, history does give us clues of where, you know, what's going to happen. I really like this one a, a lot. I never had seen this slide before, um, but it just sort of shows you uh, the different things. So if you look on the sort of the metal, it says opportunity opportunistic investor, steady investor, uncertain investor, apprehensive investor. So what it was saying in 2008, the market, if you had invested $10,000, the stock market dropped almost 40% in 2008. So that 10,000 went down to 6,000. Well, hey, cash me out, get me out of this thing. Well, what it's showing you is 15 years later, or 14 years later, if you had done that strategy, you're, yeah, it didn't go down further, because it did go down a little bit further at the beginning of January of 2009. Uh, you would have avoided more pain, but you know what? You would have, you would have been in cash. And, and, and having cash, it would have not kept up your purchasing power um, that you have. If you look on the uncertain investor, hey, I'm going to go to the sidelines for a little bit, uh, but I'll get back in a year later. That, you know, fortunately, they got back in. It went up to 26,000 versus the 6,000. Um, but what if I just stayed in the market, you know, and, and that's the difference, the 26,000 versus the 32. And that's, you know, as I look across the room, virtually nobody here is 100% in the stock market. But, you, you know, it's a conviction we have is that, you know, for your long, and hopefully you're going to have a 25, 30 year retirement. It's not just what's going to happen now. Because I hear a lot of, from our, our um, more mature clients, uh, uh, say on there, I don't have time, right? Well, the thing about this is that you, 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 it, you don't have time it, if the presumption is that you're gonna spend all your money within five to 10 years. But oftentimes we invest not only for ourselves, but for legacy. And you do have the time and your heirs have those times as you sort of think of that, those things. The final aspect of, that you see on here is, hey, do I look at it that I'm scared, or do I look at it as an opportunity? And somebody that took that original 10000 and applied $10,000 more, now that really skyrocketed. So, you know, the, you, there's a Chinese proverb, you know, you know, as far as looking at opportunities, you know, during, during times of crises. And you can see on there that if you look at it as an opportunity, not just as a, you know, a challenge that is out there. We've talked about this before, and at one point in time, we tried to find managers that could get you in um, at the low, get you out at the high, and the challenge with all of those is that the reality of it is no two recessions, bear markets are ever the same, and they they're never respond uh, the same. So what we found with a lot of the tactical managers is that they could work some of the time, but they could never work all of the time. So really, we've come back to you know sort of investing 101, you really can't time the market. 
And so this slide right here really sort of shows that if you miss the 10 best days, the 20 best days, the 30 best days, as compared to the part that you keep in stocks, you stay there. Your, your returns are fivefold compared to, you know, much more muted returns uh, by trying to get in and get out. Because, I, you know, like I said, this career has humbled me. I just, it's just really hard to, to time it. Um, you know, the slide, the title of this slide I really love, Time in the Market, Not Timing the Market. And what it's really communicate to you is that in a given year, the returns can be extremely negative, as low as minus 45%, all the way up to 53 in a year. But the further you go out, you know, and, and when you look at it, there's never been a 15-year period so far where if you've invested in those stocks, that it's going to be negative. And, and oftentimes, but it's not even just that you're positive, you're significantly positive. So, you know, it's just really, you know, keeping that long-term perspective is just so crucial.